Okay, so the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. And everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be, they ask? Isn't this Mary and Joseph's son? Then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like, you, like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in their own hometown. Certainly there were many needy, window, wi needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow, a Zarephath, in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha, but the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. This is the Holy Scripture. You may be seated. Just after uh, Linda finished her wonderful testimony, uh, Terry just said, we don't need a sermon. So uh, <laughs> maybe some of y'all need two sermons, people. That's, uh, <laughs> I had a family doctor uh, growing up from birth to young adult, and uh, he saw all of my family. And my, my mom, my, my dad, my brothers and sisters, uh, some of my aunts and uncles, he seemed to see him, everybody. Because, you know, basically we were a small town. There were, I think there were only two uh, general practitioners in the whole town. And, but people don't seem to do that anymore. I mean, we move and uh, we change insurance plans. And uh, you may need a specialist and, and all those kind of reasons why we don't seem to go to the same doctors anymore. But his name was Dr. Gerald Beasley, and I, I remember him very fondly. I, I, he had great bedside manner, uh, telling me stories and keeping my attention while, while he was examining me. And in fact, sometimes I didn't realize he was even examining me, maybe counting my heart rate or my breathing rate. The whole time he's telling me these interesting stories, I didn't realize he was interrogating me. And when I was a teen in the hospital, and I was there for two and a half weeks um, with my burns, um, he told me stories about his airplane that he had purchased. It was a kit, and he was assembling it. And all the while, he was going to classes to try to learn to be a, a pilot. So it was kind of fun to hear him talk about these stories and exciting to hear about his flying lessons and, uh, and the things like that. When I was in college and still under my parents' uh, insurance, he told me a story how he crashed that very plane out in a field somewhere, had broke both of his legs, and that he had set and splinted both of his legs uh, while he was waiting for medical help to arrive. And I thought, wow, how that, that's amazing how he could do that. And so you can imagine if he was that, that motivated for his own health, he was motivated in, and for my health as well. And he seemed to know his stuff, and he, was, and he seemed to very, very much care about my health until the one day that he crossed the line now it wasn't really like you might have me imagine it wasn't because of insurance fraud or some other kind of wrongdoing I was already out of college and I needed some medical exam for a job of mine and and I had gone to the exam room with him and he had carried my file in there but a nurse had called him back out out into the uh, foyer uh, to discuss another patient's care and so I just took the opportunity to look at my file you know it's my file it's got my stuff in it I'm gonna look at it and I was mortified one of the last entries in my medical history file, in big, bold letters, along with the diagnostic code, were these words. Early onset male pattern baldness. <laughs> I was incensed. Who does he think he is? I'm still in my 20s for at least another year or so. It didn't matter whether it was true or not that I had been seeing more of my hair accumulate on my brush and more trapped on the, the little screen at the bottom of my bathtub drain. This was the late 80s, and, and I had beautiful dark hair that I kept at least collar linked. I mean, this was a time where hair was beautiful. How could he point out the obvious, be so matter-of-fact about it? 
It didn't matter that I had a uncle on my mom's side that had already been very bald and my father had significant hair loss and balding pattern. It didn't matter that they had it. It was me. And this was before Rogaine and Propecia and all those other legitimate medical treatments. There was lots of snake oil cures for baldness, but no real doctor prescribed cure for baldness. So to me, since there was nothing medically that he could do about it, why did he have to put it in my file? <laughs> I definitely didn't want to hear it. And guess what? At that time, I changed doctors. Next time I needed to see a physician, I went to the younger, more hip guy. Not because he was better or cuter, but because my feelings were hurt from Dr. Beasley being so straight to the point and blunt about my diagnosis. And he never even mentioned it. It was just there in the file. You see, the people of Jesus' hometown were so thrilled that their hometown boy had such a good deal of excitement about hearing about him and all the other neighboring towns were talking about him. They heard the good news from these neighboring towns about all the miracles that he had done and the teachings and was beginning to get a, a good-sized crowd following him. So this day in the synagogue, Jesus does his usual thing. He attends worship with all the other faithful this was his habit. This was his custom. We talked about that last week. That the word that was used was the ethos. That this was his very character to be in God's house with God's people at the very time designated to be worshiping with God. That he had made every effort. He wasn't avoiding synagogue. He was there in the synagogue. But this time he was asked to read aloud. Now this was usually a privilege that was for those that were more respected within the synagogue and the congregation. So this implied that everyone respected Jesus when they asked him to read. And it was all going really well at first. People were amazed at his authority that he spoke with. They were excited that he was announcing the good news from the prophet Isaiah. And you could read their interactions in the few verses before our reading today from uh, verses 14 through 21 that were before our reading today. He had just said and had just read from the prophet Isaiah chapter 61, and likely everybody in the synagogue had heard these words. It was a Hebrew classic. It was a call to hope in God. That the earthly economy and the way things were going in the world that was going so wrong that somehow it was going to stand on edge and God's heavenly economy was going to come into being and God's reign would continue. This was good news for the poor. It was liberty to the captives. It was sight to the blind. Release to those who were imprisoned. This was great news for everybody who was oppressed. And especially under Roman occupation. They were oppressed. They were poor and downtrodden. And this was such great news. And the people were excited to hear this. They were amazed at Jesus' gracious words, the Bible says. Isn't this Mary and Joseph's son? We've heard so many good things about him. Boy, his family must be so proud. But you see, Jesus knows their hearts. Much like my Dr. Beasley, in telling his great stories while examining me, he was able to write down some things I didn't even know he noticed. And I'm sure that Jesus was able to understand some things about their hearts that they didn't even know he noticed. And unlike my, and much like my unsavory balding diagnosis, they weren't happy that this diagnosis comes from Jesus. And what was so inciting about Jesus' diagnostics was how it applied to them. And so I'd like for us to look at maybe how it might apply to us, the modern day reader. And what should have been the response to these hard truths that Jesus was delivering to them that day? Jesus was saying that the time of the Lord's favor was here among us. Now what that meant was this was a year of jubilee. That's what he was saying. Now the, the act, there were actually times that were the years of jubilee. It was every 50 years was a time of jubilee. In the Leviticus writings and Deuteronomy and some other places in the Old Testament, there are times that they were supposed to celebrate every seven years what they call a sabbatical year. Remember God made the earth in seven days or six days and rested on the seventh. Well, that was the same day. The sabbatical year was a year of rest. And so seven times seven was 49. So the 50th year was a year that everything rested. 
Now, there were slaves in the Bible times, and there were two different kinds of slaves. First of all, those were those that were captive nations. But there was also, this, so they've captive, captivated a na- nation and, and make them work for them. But there was also those that were considered bond servant slaves. Someone owed you a debt that they couldn't pay. Well, then they could agree to work for you for so long and be your slave, if you will, be your servant, if you will, to pay you off. And it's a little like our credit economy today. You aren't working just to put food on the table altogether or a few nice comforts. No, you work to pay your bills. You work to pay the credit card and the mortgage and the student loans and the car payments and and the taxes and and you name it, you're working to pay all those things. If those things weren't around, you'd be fine, right? Dave Ramsey says in his Financial Peace University, he says, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Another thing he says in that same saying is that we should act our wage. Wouldn't it be interesting if people started living within their wage? But in Jesus' time, the Jewish people practiced a sort of indebtedness type of slavery. And unfortunately, uh, America went the wrong way with this and misunderstood it and seemed to use this Bible passages like this and others to imply that it was okay to enslave other people. But that wasn't what was happening in the Hebrew times. And so I want to make that very clear. But the good news, no matter how large your debt was, you were released from your debt at the end of a sabbatical year. And you could be released from your debt. So you owed somebody, say, $100, and you were having to work for them, but the sabbatical year ended, you didn't have to owe the rest of that money. Every seven years, you were to let your fields go unharvested so that the poor people could go and take from it as they needed you were, able to, you were not supposed to make your animals work so they could get the year of rest that they needed. But the year of Jubilee was even extra special. At year number 50, this was a year of the Lord's favor. On this time, if you ever sold a piece of property, you got it back. Not only was the debt canceled... But even the ser- servants that, who were captured from other nations, they were supposed to be set free at this time. This was a time of great celebration. No matter what former hardships that you had faced, no matter what your family had been through, the year of the Lord's favor, your, all your debts were wiped clean. Imagine that. Even your debt of sin was wiped clean. It was almost like our bankruptcy laws, but it wasn't a black mark somehow down later when you were trying to get credit again. This was a celebration that all debts were wiped clean during this year. Now imagine, if I were a wealthy billionaire with properties all over the world, with my name on top of them saying Smith Towers... I had a lot of creditors and service providers that either I was slow in paying are never really paid. Maybe even lots of taxes that I avoided paying. And this made me famous. And even though I was great with the art of deal making, they put me in charge of some really local government agencies that seemed to also benefit me as well. And you told me that the year of Jubilee, the year of God's favor was coming. This would be great news. I wouldn't owe any of my creditors anymore. Yippee! And there was nothing they could do about it. But wait. If every property reverts to the original family owners, if I built Smith Towers in downtown Grand Prairie, and every family who first settled there gets their property back, and all the improvements I had put on it, they get it back, I get nothing. Well, I did get at least those 50 years to make money off of it. But what if I bought the property in year 30 and I only had 20 years left until the year of our favor, of the Lord's favor? I don't get my money back. I'd have to give the property back to them. And I would be debt free, but I would be property bare. I had the chance to make all that money on that property investment all those years and to keep my money and make some other investments, but the property goes back to the original family. 
Now imagine if I was sitting in the audience with Jesus and I start to get first excited about all my debt being wiped clean. But then, oh no, I have to give my property back to those folks who originally settled there that I'd paid so little for and all the labor of all those people had been working for me. Now I had to set them free. They were debt free now. Their debts were paid. That's not words maybe some people would like to hear in that moment. To us modern listeners, we average workers, average property owners ourselves, we likely would gain from this scenario. But can you see that some of the leaders in Jesus' town might have gotten a little bit out of shape of this? Was this really worth stoning someone over, though? Probably not. They were hard truths to swallow, but they already knew the score. They knew the rules. They knew what was happening. It was no big surprise that the year, the year 50 would happen. But it was interesting that Jesus was saying it was happening now, even though it really wasn't. But the biggest diagnostics that Jesus had to offer, the hardest truth that Jesus gave his particular audience was that it was a great to hear that the year of the Lord's favor was there, the year of Jubilee was going to benefit them, but the scary part was that it might benefit someone else too. Imagine that. It may even cost the listeners something. They might benefit, but it also might cost them something. That even people from other countries might get some of the same benefits. You see, the Jewish people had known for a long time that God had chosen them. This tiny little nation that started from this childless couple, Abraham and Sarah, this elderly couple that finally had a child and that they would grow into a great numerous group of people, as numerous as the stars, as uncountable as the grains of the sand. They already knew that they were going to be a great nation because God had promised that and God was with them all along. All along, God had told them that they were going to be an example, a light to other nations. Isaiah 49, 6 says, uh, God says, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will make you a light to the Gentiles and you will bring my salvation to all the ends of the earth. You see, the Hebrews had forgot that they were supposed to be a salvation for the rest of the people too. They knew there was salvation for themselves, but they forgot that there was salvation for others. So Jesus telling these stories about two different prophets, Elijah and Elisha, set them off. You see, Elijah, during the time of famine, had been sent by God to a particular widow in another town, Zarephath. It was in Israel. When Israel had their own share of widows, their own share of suffering and starvation, it was almost telling, like someone telling a MAGA hat wearer, that Jesus tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves, which includes our neighbors south of the border. Imagine that how incensed they might get over that. That might be something they would probably try to stone me over. Or telling the story of Elisha, healing the commander of a formerly warring nation, Naaman, a Syrian, from leprosy. While there were plenty of Jewish lepers around that needed healing, that this was almost like telling a progressive Christian that voted Democrat as they were responding to Sarah Huckabee Sanders the other day saying that Trump being president was part of God's divine plan. And boy, did the internet go crazy over that. All the talk shows started talking about that. God bless America. And they wanted to run her out of town with at least their opinion polls. But Jesus not only flipped the script with these hard truths, he double flipped the script. Like all the progressives listening to me just now, nodding in their heads in agreement, maybe and I think I might have even heard an amen or so, as I was calling out the bigots to task that they were mega hat wearers and that they should love those neighbors down south of the border just like they love themselves. But what if I told you as listeners who love this so wholeheartedly agreed with me that you also need to love your mega hat wearing neighbors as well? <gasps> Whoops. Where did that go? Calling out your own prejudice too. 
Or maybe flipping the script one more time when the parts of the conservative crowd nod, yes, their heads in agreement with the press secretary as she said that God appointed Jesus, appointed, whoa, that's a blasphemy now, that God appointed Trump to be the president of the hour and to say that you liberals need to suck an egg. And I say with the same topic and the same logic that everyone must submit to their governing authorities. It says in Romans 13.1, For all authority comes from God, and those in position of authority have been placed there by God. But then I remind them that if it's true with the current president, then it was true with the last president for eight years too. Amen. Yikes, I might get run out of town for that one. Or even now. Those who are listening in our audience right now that say, well, preachers shouldn't be talking about politics. I came across a quote one time that said, never trust either a preacher that tells you how to vote or a politician that tells you how to pray. We got a lot of those out there, right? But what I'm really saying, it doesn't really matter about the politics of today except the way that Jesus addressed the politics of his day. That we should stop acting like we have a monopoly on God's favor. And the other side doesn't. Is that a hard truth for you? We say we are Christ's love in the heart of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex here at Trinity. And we might feel like we are more loving than the church down the road that claims to be a Christian but fails to love their LGBT neighbors or their Muslim neighbors, or they don't have a lot of diversity in their church, or their opposite political leaning neighbors. But if we fail to see them as neighbors as well, that needs our love as well, then we are just like the folks in Jesus' day. Our response shouldn't be like Jesus' hometown, but like the church or the town in Capernaum later in the reading. Now, we didn't get to that, but Luke chapter 4, 31 shows that there is a group of people who did listen to Jesus. They found his teachings just as amazing as his own hometown did. But the difference was they believed and they repented. They accepted these hard truths. And so in benefit of that, there many miracles were performed in their town. It says later at the end of that chapter, early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place and the crowds were searching everywhere to find him. And when they finally him, found him, they begged him, begged him to stay with them, to continue teaching them, not to leave them. You see, this crowd was searching and begging to hear more while his own hometown had threatened to run him out of town and to stone him or push him off the hill. Jesus says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns too. Because that is why I was sent. Aren't you glad that Jesus' message came to your town? Aren't you glad that Jesus' message comes right here to us today? So Jesus continues to travel around, preaching in the synagogues and throughout all of Judea, it says. And our response to the hard truth is that we should be asking Jesus for more, not stubbing our toes on it and cussing the rock. We should find solutions and be praying to be used by God to bring healing to our nation, not more division. Here it is, Black History Month. And there's lots of churches that may or may not talk about it. And there's a bunch of churches that may talk about it, but not really be welcoming of diver diversity. Emancipation proclamation happened a long time ago, but yet we still see our people of color getting less of a benefit of living here in the American nation than anywhere else. What's wrong with us? Jesus tells us to love our neighbors just like he was telling them a long time ago. We shouldn't be trying to run Jesus out of town or out of our life, but we should be begging to hear more of God's word, no matter how uncomfortable it gets. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you as a people from every tribe, every nation, every language. Some indigenous peoples of this land, some are refugees, some are immigrants, some are travelers, but all of us come to you as one body together. 
And Christ, we ask that we hear your messages and we ask that you stay with us so we can hear more. In Jesus' holy name, amen.